Welcome to On Par with the President. Today we are joined by former LSU football player and current PhD candidate James Stampley. Stampley already holds two bachelor's degrees from LSU in psychology and kinesiology, and he's currently a kinesiology PhD candidate with a focus on exercise physiology. On Par with the President is a podcast that highlights LSU community members who are doing great things. A golfer who can play par golf is at the very top of the game. And so the whole point of this podcast is to talk to extraordinary members of the LSU community. We're going to tee off. You're originally from Baton Rouge. What is it like to be a member of the football team and to earn a degree from LSU in light of the fact that you're a native of the city? It's, it's been huge to be able to get some bachelor's degrees from LSU and uh, play ball at LSU. Uh, growing up here, LSU is the biggest thing. You know, the only thing that's bigger than LSU would probably be the Saints here in Louisiana. And so for me to be a part of the team and also continue my education, it's been a dream. And I've been loving every second of it. And we're going to give you a do. You earned two undergraduate degrees from LSU. How, that's an impressive feat. Most people struggle getting one. How did you balance your time as a, a scholar and a student athlete? Well, I'll tell you this. It wasn't without its trial and error. I feel like as a student athlete, one of the biggest challenges that you face is how to effectively balance your time between being an athlete, a competitive athlete, but also being a competitive student as well. You're essentially having this full-time job, but also you still have to earn really good grades because at the end of the day, we're all students. It took some um, experimentation um, with how much time I allotted to one thing compared to the other, but I eventually found that balance and I feel like that's the key. Well, you're currently working on a PhD in exercise physiology. Um, why did you make the decision to engage in further education, and what do you hope to accomplish with your newfound research findings and great education you're receiving here at LSU? I'm glad you asked. Um, I've always been a bit of an overachiever, <laughs> and so I've all, and I've always had a mind for, um, for science. I originally got my psychology degree first while I was playing. Years later, I had the epiphany that my other passion has always been fitness and health. And so I felt like it was a natural progression for me to go to kinesiology next. I just wanted to further my knowledge with uh, exercise to see how that could benefit me originally. But then the more I was in the field, the more I saw the other side of it from just a general health perspective. I really realized that there was this gap in knowledge. And so I started transitioning my thinking to wanting to apply my knowledge and my research to benefit people on a, I guess, a more global scale to help your average everyday person become more equipped with the knowledge that they would need to live a healthy, fulfilling life. So that's kind of how I made that transition over to kinesiology. Wonderful. So your transition involves research. And your research centers on metabolism and the role that exercise can play in aging. How are you conducting this research and what do you hope to learn in light of your goals that you just talked about? So metabolism, that's one of the things that um, stood out to me immediately that I was really interested in. And one of the people that I can thank for steering me in that direction is my current advisor, Dr. Brian Irving. When I came back to get my kinesiology degree, he was my exercise physiology professor. And so I was still fresh in the field, trying to figure out what I was interested in. We had this lecture and he went into details about what he researched. It clicked for me. That's what I wanted to do. Like I was interested in metabolism and how it worked. I just reached out to him and uh, let him know that I wanted to continue research with him in metabolism. And so that's how that's how it kind of got started. He has a study currently ongoing where he's working on different training methods with older individuals to see what methods get them in the best shape. So we know like there are a lot of people 
that suffer from like cardiometabolic disorders, but to actually work with older individuals and kind of show them how to effectively train and to see them progress, it's really helped me develop more of a passion for it. And as far as my uh, studies go, right now I'm currently working on a method to where we can exercise train fruit flies. It's interesting because a lot of people, they wonder like, okay, fruit flies, like that's quite a turn from like exercising people. It came about for a number of different reasons. The first being um, during this pandemic, it presents some interesting challenges with um, recruiting and conducting research safely on human subjects. With fruit flies, you know, there's not that much risk to You're me. You're not worried about getting COVID from a fruit fly. I guess. I'm not worried yeah, about it you. whatsoever. <laughs> but also, it allows us opportunity to kind of work on the basic science on some of the things that we want to learn. And so what I'm doing is uh, exercise training the flies. At this point, I've become quite a name in the fly community as a personal trainer. So if you are a friend, know any flies that are looking to get in the best shape of their life, I'm definitely the guy to get in touch with. Gotcha. So let me ask you, um, you don't get to do research unless you have a great mentor. It, it doesn't work that way. You don't, you know, you could go at home and play with a chemistry set or something like that. But when you're, you're talking about funded research, you have to have a mentor. Talk, talk to me a little bit about um, the camaraderie in your program and what is it like to work closely with an advisor or a mentor? It's been a real blessing to be a part of this program. I think that Dr. Solomon has done a fantastic job at um, really making the department feel more like a family. And that's how it feels, especially so in the exercise physiology department. So my advisor is Dr. Irving, but I also work with Dr. Gim Spillman, Dr. Neil Johansson, Dr. Alloway, you know how they say it takes a village to raise a child? So it's kind of like the same method. I'm learning from everyone. And so I get different perspectives on different subjects, and it all just helps build me into a better researcher. So in that sense, it, it kind of feels like being back on the football team. It's this big family environment, and we all just want to do good. The better I do, the better they do. Now, as a football player, you had a very interesting trajectory in the sense that you walked on and then you earned a scholarship and then you moved to be a starter at fullback. You know, talk to us a little bit about that journey. How did you make that happen? How did all that work out? I originally came to LSU as just a student. Not many people know this, but I originally didn't have any intentions on playing uh, football at LSU. I went to a small 3A high school. Um, Baker High. I was one of the strongest people at the school, but we had a shortage of big bodies for the football team. So with my strength, they kind of figured I'd do well on the offensive line. Now, in high school, I was all of 200 to 210 pounds playing center. I did well for myself, but when I made the decision to come to LSU, I knew I wasn't going to play center at LSU. I just didn't have the frame for it. So I kind of just convinced myself that it probably wouldn't happen. And then I got to know some of the football players and they convinced me to walk on. I decided that the position that I could play effectively would be fullback because it's kind of a hybrid position between a lineman and a running back, especially the way we played it. And so I just I walked on. Um, got in touch with the running back coach, told him I was interested in playing fullback. I actually started on the team during spring. For some strange reason, we had a lot of injuries to the fullbacks that spring. So at one point, I was the sole fullback during all the spring football. It was to the point to where we had the spring game and I played fullback for both teams. I would like go out there um, for the offense on one team and then when they switched the defense, I would change my jersey on the sideline and go out there for the other team. Safe to say that was a rough game for me. <laughs> but <laughs> but it was a rough game. But 
uh, I think I really opened some eyes and impressed some people about like my tenacity for the position. And so that next season, um, I got invited to camp and they actually gave me the starting position after my first spring. And I had a really good season. The next season came along. I performed well again. I showed up to the building one day and then one of the coaches came and found me and he was telling me that Coach Miles, who was the head coach at the time, he wanted to see me in his office. And so I get in there and you know, he looks me up and down, talks to me a little bit and he was like, well, how would you feel about being put on scholarship? And I was speechless. I'm typically a person that always has something to say. I'm just chatty like that, but I had nothing for that moment. And it was, it was a high point. So talk to me about some of your other high points. We want to hear about some of the other things that happened to you during your time on the football team that you would say it was like the highlight of my experience. Oh, there are so many stories on that one. Okay, I'll start with one. It's a funny story, slightly embarrassing, but funny. Um, I have the reputation as one of the hardest hitters um, at LSU. I was notorious for going through face masks and helmets. So we had gotten this um, helmet that I think it was more in its prototype period. Like it wasn't out there yet. So we kind of wanted to test it out and see how it worked. I'm like the prime candidate for something like that. And so the way it worked was it had all these sort of airbags in the helmet. And so on contact, they would, you know, do what airbags do. They would like inflate. It was a very neat helmet. The issue with the helmet was the surface of them got really slippery when you would sweat. So the helmet would slide on my head. So I would go in, make blocks, and it'd slide down. And so the airbag started hitting me in the eye. And so eventually my eye just swelled up like in camp, like it, it looked like I lost the fight. This happened at the worst time because we had a media day. And so we had to go out there, sign posters, meet the fans. And I had this huge black eye. They gave me some shades to wear during the media day. And so I'm sitting there signing posters and everyone's calling me Hollywood because it's like I have these shades on. And so I see my mom and my mom is looking at me like, what are you doing? Why do you have on shades? And so I lift my glasses so she could see. And the look on her face was priceless. <laughs> I had to assure her that I was OK and that no one put hands on me. But it was it that that initial shock was hilarious. So, so needless to say, you, you did not want to be subject to any more experiments. <laughs> that, that was, was it. it for you. huh? Yeah, I was I was OK with the uh, experimental helmets at that point. But one of my greatest accomplishments was when I got my first and only touchdown against Ole Miss. The way we played fullback back then and the way I played it was I wanted to make the position my own. So I was less of a fullback and I was what I would call myself an offensive linebacker. I was one of those people that put me in coach who you want me to take out. I'm going for him. Like I was that guy. We were doing really well in this uh, game. This was my senior year and we got there to the goal line and they call uh, a fullback running play. And I was in, I'm like, oh, okay, they're about to switch me out. And they were like, no, you're doing it. And I was like, Okay, we'll do it then. <laughs> and so it took me a couple of attempts, but I got in that end zone. And that is kind of hard to put that one into words. It was a great feeling, and I really enjoyed it. And that, that lives on forever for me. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. You mentioned being a hard hitter. They tell me you broke 30 face masks and even a helmet while you were playing. Who do you credit with? giving you the great lessons on leveraging your, your force and physicality. I was always told that, especially in football, if you're not the hammer, you're the nail. And I picked early in life to not be the nail. But one of the people that helped me develop as a fullback slash offensive linebacker was my coach, Coach Frank Wilson. He was a phenomenal coach and he taught me plenty of things on the field, but also a lot off the field and he was just a great role model and he just helped me really learn to play that position because 
it's a lot different than being a running back, uh, especially with the way we played it. You're essentially going into combat every time you step on that field because you're going to take someone out. And so he just helped develop that warrior mentality when I'm on the field. I blame him for some of those masks that I brought. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very excited that Coach Wilson is back back yeah. here at LSU uh, bleeding the purple and gold. And I know he's going to do great things with our new coach. So it's exciting. I'm excited for the for the players who get to learn under him because as much of a good mentor and coach as he is, he's also just a great person in general. It's hilarious. He made work feel not as intimidating as it is. I'm looking forward to seeing seeing him back in action here at LSU. Let, let's talk a bit about how you're funded. So one of the things that's important in, in grad education is the funding. You have an economic development assistantship for research that was funded to really impact the economic situation here in the state of Louisiana, your home, your home state. Uh, what does that mean to you as a native of the state? Cardiometabolic diseases, they're, they're a big thing down here. And they cost a lot in healthcare because of that. You'd see it all the time, like uh, just people around you, friends, family members that, you know, suffer in some aspect because of it. One of the things that I would like to do with my research is just to be able to put us in a better position to where people have the knowledge to be able to make the decisions to, you know, lead a healthier life to where, you know, that wouldn't affect the economy as much as it does. But also just because I want everyone to be able to enjoy health as long as they can, because, you know, we're living longer. And so I want us to be able to enjoy that extension on life, but be healthy and capable as well. So how do you think science and scientists can better do a better job of communicating their ideas and making them accessible to the general public? I think that's an interesting question. And I think that stems from people's innate desire to seek something familiar. With familiar comes security, comes comfort. Were we to have people in research positions that were to be familiar to other people. So like if you had people in there who you can identify with, whether that be someone um, in a minority or someone who has different uh, sexual preferences, to see people in these positions conducting research, communicating what they are learning, I feel like that makes people more comfortable with the research. I feel like that helps people digest and absorb um, the knowledge so much more. And I also think that that starts with the education. If you have you know, children that see people in these positions as well, it motivates them to want to try to strive and achieve it. They don't cap themselves as thinking that that's not something that they can accomplish. You know, I, I'm a firm believer of lead by example. And so that's why I try to live a life that people would want to try to accomplish and do the things that I do. What are you most proud of in terms of the work you've been doing? The thing that I feel like and this could be a cop-out answer, but it's not a cop-out answer, I promise. The thing that I'm most proud of is the fact that I haven't grown complacent and I'm still ambitious. Because the way I see it is that I've accomplished a lot in life. I don't think my greatest accomplishment is behind me yet. I think I have many more accomplishments ahead of me, and I feel like the greatest one is yet to come. That being said, you know, this PhD pans out and once I actually get that, that'll be really high up there to actually have that in my, uh, have that notch on my belt. I feel happy that I'm still ambitious and I have that desire to want to continue to accomplish. Like I'm proud that I haven't lost that. And so I just want to keep going and see what all I can do. How important was it for you to continue your PhD studies here at LSU? Oh, I love it. I feel like um, I definitely bleed purple and gold at this point. There's a streak of it somewhere on the practice fields out there at LSU. <laughs> but it's, um, it's, it's been huge. Um, born and raised here in Louisiana. I feel like I've been 
extremely blessed to be able to continue my education here as well and be surrounded by family and friends who I've known most of my life. Uh, it's come to my attention that in addition to your academic focus, you're, you're still a competitive athlete. You recently won two gold medals in Brazilian jiu-jitsu at a national tournament. How did you become interested in jiu-jitsu and how does your football background help you with that? So I've always had this love of martial arts ever since I was a kid. So once I was finally finished with football, I decided now would be the perfect time to indulge in martial arts. You know, my other uh, interest is one of those things that I tell people it's like you can take the tiger off the field, but you can't take the field out of the tiger. I never lost that competitive drive. And you can see it in my research. Like I'm always trying to like, I'm trying to be the best at what I'm doing. It gives me another avenue to use some of that competitive energy. And it gives me something that I can compete in for the rest of my life because there really isn't like an age cap on how long you can compete in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I think that's one of the things that keeps us young is that you always have something that you're striving to achieve. So you'll continue to make yourself grow and improve so you can continue to pursue whatever that passion is. Well, James, I'm excited that you brought your intellect and competitive spirit to the world of science and that you're adding value to science here in the state of Louisiana and right here at LSU. Um, it's a tremendous honor to spend this time with you, and um, I hope that you complete your PhD studies during my tenure as president so I can be there at the graduation to celebrate with you and your family. Um, you're a great story, and um, you're adding a lot of value to our enterprise here, and thank you for the time. Um, we wish you the very best with your research, and I did not ask you when you were going to graduate, so... That's the number one rule with PhD students. Don't ask them that question. Just keep publishing. Crank it out. I'm so glad that I'm so glad <laughs> that you didn't. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. Take care.